Good afternoon. I have the unenviable position of trying to keep you all awake after such a lovely lunch, but I hope that the topic will um, be educational. Thanks to the Global Soft Foundation for including this topic because what we're looking at is antiquities trafficking and how it's supporting terrorism around the country, around the world, I mean. Let me start with a short video to set the stage of why this issue is so important. So cultural destruction is actually taking place on a scale that we haven't seen since World War II. And this plunder of our history is funding terrorism and organized crime around the world. Cultural terrorism, an attempt to eradicate history by destruction of its symbols, is being used to intimidate populations who enjoy religious and political freedoms that differ from those of the violent extremist organizations who are perpetrating these crimes. And they are crimes. Internet intentional destruction and looting of historic sites is a violation of the Hague Convention and the Geneva Convention and the Rome Statutes. And the United States and people like Martha here in the video are a target for funding this terrorism. So it's a pleasure to be here on this stage with all of you, especially since it's special forces who actually played such a critical role in this saga. On the night of May 15, 2015, U.S. Special Operations Forces led a mission in eastern Syria to capture the senior Daesh leader, Abu Sayyaf, the organization's chief financial officer, and the proclaimed emir of oil and gas. It was U.S. Special Forces who actually found the smoking gun, the definitive link of antiquities trafficking being used to finance terrorism in the Middle East. At the time, Daesh's trade and natural resources had been well documented, along with a thriving business in extortion and ransom. But special forces determined that Daesh had developed another critical income stream, ancient art ripped from the archeological ruins and museums of the cradle of civilization. A treasure trove of documents exposed the trade in great detail. They confirmed earlier warnings that Daesh's antiquities operations are far more systemic than the opportunistic grave robbing that has taken place in the region over the centuries. Its cultural racketeering, as we call it, is industrial, methodical, and strictly controlled from the highest level of the organization's leadership. Daesh created a ministry of extraction, and they split it into two parts, one for oil, and one for antiquities. With hundreds of thousands of archeological sites spread across Iraq, Syria, and the lands beyond, it was a virtually limitless source of revenue. Daesh was meticulous in their record keeping. They issued formal permits for looting, and they licensed heavy machinery to aid in the plunder. They charged for each of these licenses, and then they taxed the sale of any of the discoveries. These were items that were actually found at the compound, presumably waiting for sale to willing buyers. And these are some of the articles that we had traced through people, uh, archaeologists who risked their life to track a lot of these, actually, in Syria, of items that were found after Daesh had issued permits to go out and do this illicit digging. And on the computers that were seized in the compound, there were hundreds of other items, other artifacts that were waiting to be sold or had been sold. As uh, the general from Iraq said earlier today, Daesh was very sophisticated in their use of social media and propaganda. 
and you may have seen the heart-wrenching video that they had put out about their looting and destruction at the Mosul Museum and how they had destroyed many of the, uh, the statues that were on display there. But while they were destroying these statues on camera for what they claimed were religious purposes, behind the scenes they actually were plundering and trafficking them for profit. And many of the pieces that actually had been looted from that museum were actually found in this compound still with the museum numbers on them. A very cynical attitude towards this. The Daesh leadership is very hypocritical, as I said, but also very clever. They knew that with a limited supply of antiquities, it would drive up the price and drive up demand. And that's why we saw so much destruction at Palmyra, at Mosul, and other places. It was a very sophisticated understanding of how markets work. At its height, they also had a um, very complex process for the sale of these antiquities, where they could tax, depending on how quickly the item could be sold, out on the open market or to international buyers, a percentage of what was sold. They even had their own auction house in Raqqa, for items that if an individual wasn't able to sell them in time, they would seize them and sell them themselves. So in this chart here, you can see how it actually worked. In receipts that were found on just one computer in that compound, in just that region, they had calculated receipts and revenues of over $5 million. So imagine the scale. So what was the extent of the destruction? It's not just Daesh who's been encouraging the illicit trade in antiquities. Since the Arab Spring, we've seen the massive rise in cultural destruction, looting, and trafficking across the whole region as by other violent extremist organizations as well as organized crime, from attacks against the pyramids in Egypt, museums in Tunisia, and the destruction of historic libraries in Mali, and so much more and there's significant profit to be made in this black trade. As you can see in the satellite imagery of the before and after, they went into sites and the looter pits are the round holes. For archeologists, they have very systematic approach and rectangular shape. We can even see through satellite imagery where they actually made discoveries. You can see the mounds of dirt that look like a donut, but it's turned parts of the Middle East into essentially Swiss cheese as you look at the development of this destruction. Anything not perceived to have a monetary value was destroyed. We've lost insight into many ancient civilizations and historical context by this haphazard antiquities gold rush. As Anything that was just viewed in their minds as having historical, not monetary value, was cast aside. Museums across the region were some of the first sites that were attacked as civil order broke down in the Arab Spring. And I'm sure some of you in this room had an opportunity to visit the Mosul Museum. This is what it looked like when troops were able to take back the city and go back into the museum. To help visualize the destruction, my organization had worked in creating a heat map where we did an overlay of the violent extremist organizations who were operating in different parts of the Middle East and North Africa, along with how they were making their money and the sites that they were destroying. We could see a very clear pattern as it started to cross the region. And contrary to a lot of popular thinking on what their targets were, the overwhelming majority of items that were destroyed or, or sites that were destroyed were actually Islamic. So what's being looted? It's hard to track the size of the illicit trade, particularly now we don't even have numbers on what the legitimate trade in antiquities is. And many of the sales take place on social media like WhatsApp and Facebook, which makes them very difficult to follow. If we had some of the uh, capabilities of the intelligence community from the panels earlier, we might have a little more insight into it. But online sales through eBay and other action sites are proliferating. You can see from these, these are just a few items that have been seized in the last few months, and you can see the value that they go for. Yet we know 
because of this, um, because of these items that we've been able to seize and get, get the prices on, that they sell in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the U.S. government has estimated that the antiquities trade just from the region of Daesh runs in the millions of dollars annually. And there are loot to order sales on social media and on the dark web. What can Daesh buy with it? A lot. You will know more than we do about what the sale of a million dollar antiquities can buy them. It can fund a lot of terrorists. So where is the market? There's a vast global market for antiquities, but the United States market is the largest in the world at almost 45%. It makes it a destination of choice, especially since, until recently, the price to play has been very low. In August 2015, the FBI issued a rare alert to the art market. It received credible, rep credible reports that artifacts that had been looted by Daesh were reaching the United States, and that many in collect and it warned that collectors and dealers who purchase them may find themselves funding illicit weapons and troops. They also warned that anyone who knowingly was dealing in these antiquities could actually be tried on the terrorism statutes, which was the first time that this ever happened. But it's not shady institutions who are engaging in this trade. Just in the last few months, each of these world-renowned organizations has had to return illicitly obtained antiquities, and that's just a few of them. Even one of the most well-respected museums in the world, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, just in the last few months had to return a major piece to Lebanon that had been looted during the Lebanese Civil War. They didn't do their homework before they accepted it. And many of the wealthiest families in the United States are supporting this trade. Michael Steinhardt is the father of the hedge fund industry based in New York. The Manhattan DA's office raided his offices and his home in New York, and they seized over a million dollars in illicitly obtained antiquities. The Green family, who are behind the Hobby Lobby craft uh, stores, they had to return over 5,000 illicitly obtained artifacts from Iraq just this summer and were fined over $3 million. And the Berwaltas family, they have a collection that has been estimated over $50 million. And they have been shown that um, as the assistant district attorney's office in New York, since New York is the center of the art market, it's the district attorney's office there that's been the most active. Uh, they had the assistant district attorney in Manhattan, Matt McDonough, said about this family that they were acquiring without even the faintest hint of a whisper about whether it was a lawful antiquity. So this is being financed by some of the most sophisticated collectors in the United States. Why should we care? As Daesh scatters and foreign fighters are returning home, they're bringing with them the skills, the contacts, and the know-how about this illicit trade. Nowhere have we seen more clearly where this matters than in Europe, which is the home to many of these foreign fighters, but also the second largest art market. And Brussels, the capital of Belgium, but also the headquarters of the European Union, has long been a destination of choice for these illegally trafficked antiquities, a category that includes funders of terrorism that have taken the lives throughout the West in the past year. Belgium brings together all the elements of the illicit that allow the illicit trade to flourish. Lacks laws and enforcement for art crimes, a location with easy access to the rest of the world, dealers shown to be complicit in the illicit trade, a steady stream of refugees, and a ready market. The European Union's de facto capital is also home to the terror cells dependent upon criminal activity to fund violence. The municipality of Molenbeek, where the terrorists planned the 2015 Paris attacks, is a hub for the illegal trafficking. And today, its homegrown terrorists have access to an unprecedented supply of plundered artifacts from Iraq and Syria and beyond. And unfortunately, terrorism is a low-cost business. Experts estimate that the terrorist attacks in Paris cost in the range of $90,000. It doesn't take many antiquities to try and fund this terrorism. The French language magazine, 
Paris Match has exposed clear links between cultural racketeering and terrorist financing in Belgium, including the violent extremist network responsible for the deadly Brussels attack on the 22nd of March, 2016. As Daesh changes its tactics to encourage lone wolf attacks, we are very concerned about antiquities being a source of this financing. And without increased and steady vigilance, it won't take much for these terrorists to access the United States art market and try to use antiquities to fund terror on our soil. I focused on the challenges in the Middle East, as this is where the situation is the most dire, but the illicit trade is financing networks, organized crime, and extremist organizations around the world. We see mass looting in China, we're seeing it in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, where the drug cartels are using it as a form of money laundering. So what can be done? It doesn't sound, it sounds quite dire, but, but there are things that can be done. Raising awareness is essential. As special forces operate in these conflict regions, just watching out for signs of the trade. Seizing the documents and the computers that track them and making the information available will help raise awareness about the importance of stopping the illicit trade, particularly across countries where these networks are operating so that there's sharing of information. Law enforcement must be more engaged. In major art markets, New York, Los Angeles, Paris, London, instead of art crime squads being uh, dismembered, they should be actually bolstered. Because at this time, it's a great means with, with prices and being viewed as an investment where the financing is going up, particularly when there's limited supply coming from places like Palmyra. The costs are going up and the art crimes need a specialized understanding of how to look for these artifacts. Until recently, even the Department of Justice's attitude has been to simply seize them. In the case of the Green family, nobody's going to jail, they're simply having a fine, and these items are repatriated, so the cost of doing business is very low. Make use of international laws and regulations. UNESCO has the govern is the governing body for the treaties that have become the basis for most countries' domestic law. We need to see them enforced, not just established. And supply cut countries need to be more active. We work very closely with a number of the governments in the Middle East to upgrade their own legal systems and to ensure that they have taken account of these issues and included fighting against the trade in antiquities as part of their fight against terrorism. And very simply, don't buy conflict antiquities. If you're buying from any of these areas where you know there's unrest, make sure that you've done your homework on the provenance. It's not that difficult. I greatly appreciate all of you listening today, and for the Global Soft Foundation giving us a platform to share this information. I appreciate your vigilance in keeping certainly our country safe. As the daughter of an Air Force fighter pilot, I understand the risks of doing that and what's involved. And we know that you are and have been on the front lines in fighting against violent extremism. These attacks against culture are attacks against the symbols that we hold very dear. The freedom of religion, the freedom of expression, and the freedom of speech. Don't let them erase our history as a means to terrorize our future. Thank you.